Hey. Hello. There's a slight risk I'll get kicked out. Uh, the meeting room I was supposed to be in no longer exists. Uh, so I'm just betting <laughs> that uh, no one will try to take this one. Did they uh, shuffle the names? Uh, I think they turned it into some kind of workspace or something. Oh, okay. And then maybe just the system's out of sync. Oh, no, I'm getting kicked out. All right, I'll see you soon. Yeah. Hi, Victor. Welcome. Hello, I, I'm just here to listen and learn. Yeah, well, welcome. Is this your first time? Yeah, first time. Okay. Uh, actually, no, not, not first time. I'm, I'm learn a little bit about the the policy. Uh, as you know, just learning about agents. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, feel free to add anything to agenda, and if you have any questions, yeah, feel free to chime in. Okay. We'll give a few minutes for folks to join in and Max to find the new room. Hello, welcome back. Hello. Oh no. Uh, no, no. no fail. All right. Third time's the charm. <laughs> An adventure. Hey, Prachi. Hey, Rita. Uh, we're waiting for Max to find the room. Oh, there he is. There's still a risk. There's still a risk. <laughs> I say in five minutes, if I'm not kicked out, this meeting room will stick, at least yeah, until the half. I see some new faces. Uh oh, I can't hear. I don't know if that's you Is or me. Can you hear me? Uh, I I can hear you. Oh, okay. I think it's you, Max. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud. Rita's very quiet. Oh. Oh no. Uh yeah, I, yeah, that's good. Okay. I I said I see some new faces. Welcome. Hello. Welcome, Prachi. 
Thank you. Cool. Are we okay to get started? Um, let's see. So let me do um, I think I added the, the target handler refresh to the agenda last week. Do you want to start with that? Um, yeah, if, uh, if y'all are willing. I might join this Zoom on my computer just for chat purposes too. And Prachi and Victor, if you have any uh, items you want to discuss, yeah, please put that to the meeting notes. Uh, I share them in the chat. Are you trying to share, Max? Oh, oh, you want me to uh, share? Oh, Wait, I thought uh, you were going to share. Sorry, go ahead. I, I thought you were going to share. It's, it's either way, it's fine. Um, uh, no, I may as well. Uh, it's been a while since I've done this on Zoom. Share screen. Boom tab. Refresh. I can't tell if this is actually being presented to people. It's not. Uh... Huh. Maybe I need to join video? Is that what's happening here? Uh, we. All right, this is odd. Uh, let me try sharing again. Something just rebooted on the tab. All right, that looks like it did a thing. All right, so right now, now you can see up my nose. Let me stop that. Uh, there we go. So the um, uh, point of this document is that uh, there's a there's like a fundamental conflict right now uh, in how policy is is being presented just by virtue of choices we've made early on and the fact that, we kind of blurred the line between uh, enforcement that is specific to webhook and purely state-based enforcement, right? Enforcement that makes sense for audit and for uh, like the Gator CLI. And there's, one very big difference uh, between the the webhook uh, environment versus audit and Gator is the type of contextual information available, right? Like requesting user only makes sense for webhook, right? Like during audit, you have no idea who created the thing. Uh, so you have no way of writing those policies. Uh, Gator CLI, you could argue maybe if you're like Git, you could look at the committer, but uh, even so, uh, it's less likely to be there. Uh, another example would be old object, right? Old object only makes sense if it's a delete or uh, an update request, right? Which de facto audit will not have that. Uh, also, it's 
unlikely that GitHub will have that. Again, you could kind of like engineer a system that could, uh, but then you're kind of um, dealing with a webhook already uh, there. Request verb is, is another one. And so I, the way I see it, this kind of has two major impacts. Uh, the first impact is on writers of constraint templates, right? So if you're an author of a constraint template, the interface is muddied, right? Like if I want to write something like Kate's required labels, uh, and I want to, uh, yeah, you know, should, should I only look at object? Can I look at some of these other resources on request, right? Like what is the impact of that? Uh, conversely, if I want to write something that sometimes works in audit, sometimes doesn't, right? I, I need to like wind up creating shims that detect, am I operating in an audit context? Am I not developing, uh, knowledge and code around the idea that certain uh, certain parameters on the request will be either undefined or defined in different ways, uh, depending on the context in which the resource is called. Uh, and that has uh, downstream impacts for the user, right? Like how a given constraint template works, you and what kind of contextual data is required to evaluate it, you're reliant on the constraint template author to clearly communicate that, or you need to understand the code with which the constraint template is authored to kind of see what data is uh, being relied upon. And also if, I, if a constraints author wants to do something like matching against requesting user, like matching against resource, like matching against request verb, uh, it's, there's no clear indicator that, hey, you could do that for the webhook and it will work for the webhook, but it will not work for audit. It will not work for data CLI. Right, and so our current solution is just to not offer those matchers, right? And say, well, you can you can gloss over that. You can add the equivalent function in Rego, which then brings us full circle back to the problem for constraint template authors, right? Where if they want to provide support for those matchers, then they need to be aware of the context in which the environment is written. Consumers of those constraint templates need to understand, hey, is it optional that this context be there? or is it required, right? So, so because we've been a little bit fuzzy with our interface, uh, we've kind of hit a point where usability suffers and where uh, there are certain features that it just isn't wise for us to offer, right? Because they, they can't be exported. And so what Target Handler Refresh is proposing is that we adopt this directional approach of separating out uh, admission as its own target versus just purely state-based policies that are exportable to audit, to Gator CLI as a different target, uh, and various primitives around making sure that even if you have state-based policies, you can still export them to work in admission webhooks as certain users might expect, right? Like if I have a, a label constraint, right? Kate's required labels. Uh, a constraint template author is only concerned about the state, but that doesn't mean that a constraint author might not want to say something like, do not delete resources that have this like required label on it, right? or I only want to analyze labels on update requests or, or whatever it is, right? And so this design provides mechanisms for separating out those concerns. Um, I do not view this document as like a, hey, this all needs to be implemented at once right away. 
I, the core thing that I'm looking to unblock right now are stories around validating admission policy, right? Because uh, validating admission policy does have some primitives where it makes sense uh, to to um, I'm sorry, I'm 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 gonna forget because it's been a while since I wrote this. Uh, it does have some situations where you want to say match against a request verb. Uh, I think there's also the concern about uh, failure policy, right? Uh, let's see, is that okay? No, no, no. For VAP uh, specifically, it's about supporting matching against operations and request a user. Uh, that's right. So, like, the I don't think failure policy is in this doc. What's up? I don't think failure policy is in this doc. Uh, it's not. It's not. Um, <clears throat> and then VAP is closer to V2 in this case? So, what this is, is it's if we buy into the conceptual uh, model provided in this doc. Uh, this doc provides like a short term and a long term fix, right? So if we wanted to support requesting user uh, or operations uh, right now, right? Because we only have the case admission target, right? Our options either are to not support it, right? And just forget it or add it. And if we add it, the question becomes, okay, well, if I'm an audit, Right, and there's this requesting user matcher. What do I do? Right, like I, I don't have the context to evaluate that. Should I fail? Should I not? Um, and without the ability to have multi uh, enforcement point enforcement actions, like JDIPS thing. There would be no way around that particular edge case, right? Like it'd be nice if you could just disable audit to avoid that error, right? So you could still have that feature where it's relevant. Um, and so once JDIP's done with his work, that will be possible. We'll unblock uh, the ability to for users to specify this, but we will still have the obligation to call out that edge case users will need to be aware of that edge case and that, hey, if I'm using requesting user, I need to make sure this only gets enforced at webhook. Otherwise I'll get errors, right? Um, and so uh, once JDIP's thing is done, we can accept that short-term complexity, add that feature, and then this provides a long-term roadmap about how to get users and ourselves out of needing to be aware of that edge case. Uh, and with regard to, uh, to, to failure policy uh, uh, for VAP specifically, I think one option uh, would be if VAP became its own target as well. Right, you could imagine setting the failure policy there. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, it, as, as part of, I don't know if it would be a match condition or not. I'd, I'd have to think a little bit more about that. Anyway, sorry, that's. Uh, I wish I uh, was a bit more focused in what I just said. But it, are you? Are is that kind of clear what I'm talking about? The short term, long term. Yeah, so it sounds like the V2 is not for VAP specifically, but we want a VAP target in the future that's specific right. to VAP. I, right? So uh, potentially we want a VAP target in the future. Uh, I think we do want to be able to match against request verb and requesting user. Oh, right, this is for supporting delete in VAP. That's what it was, right? Uh, because right now we're just saying we're only creating VAP policies against create and update uh, because there's some concerns around like 
If you just assume delete, then you get some really weird behaviors, right? But that's all we can do is make an assumption one way or another. There's no place to hang that config knob without adding an, op uh, an operation matcher, right? Uh, but if we add an operation matcher, we're assuming webhook, right? Which puts us into this edge case of, okay, it's audit, operation makes no sense, that context isn't available, what's the right thing to do, right? Uh, so JDIP's PR, or sorry, JDIP's design for multi, uh, uh, multi enforcement point enforcement actions gives users the tools for navigating that edge case, uh, but it still leaves them with the responsibility to navigate that edge case. And what this whole uh, uh, multi, uh, multi target design does is it removes the edge case, right? So things should be simpler for users and uh, constrained template authors and frankly us going forward. Um, I added one comment to the doc, uh, just for the poll. Uh, do we want to call it like something like is template v1 instead of like legacy, just in case we need to do this again? Oh yeah, like uh, I I'm definitely happy to like bike shed on on naming. Um, I think if we're bought into the overall concept, that's the most important thing right now. Like. If if we if we like the shape, we can use whatever names make people happy. Uh, I I would be mostly concerned with are people directionally in alignment with the dog. Rita, did you have any concerns? Yeah, it's all in the comments. <laughs> yeah, uh, did, uh, we want to talk about this. <laughs> uh. I mean, we could go through the comments. Um, I, 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 uh, maybe before we talk about the like the sort of like the long term, uh, changes. Maybe I want to understand like short term, what are we doing, and versus long term, because, uh, my biggest concern is the operational and development burden. Yeah, we really don't want to support like all the variations. If you get, I think it's just a pain for the user as well as like ourselves having to maintain that. It yeah, hopefully in the end this is transparent to the user. Um, I it, like this tries to insulate constraint temp, uh, constraint consumers. Uh, most of all, right? Like what worked before could continue to work. Constraint template authors can also ignore this until they they want to update to the new thing, at which point they would need to do work, but everything that worked before would continue to work. Um, and so in terms of like what's happening now, or what, honestly, again, I think this more unblocks things that we want to do anyway, mm -hmm. right? So if we think about our current thread which is VAP, mm -hmm. uh, the blocking concern is how do we support delete, right? Right, right. Which, uh, which by the way, in execution plan, like keep developing VAP and add operations and requesting user matchers to the existing case target handle. That's what I thought we were going to do anyway, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, so I, I don't have a problem with like, adding these, and this is what I suggested as well, right? Um, I'm just concerned about like the amount of changes that are introduced in this proposal and how we can provide a good transition uh, or, or migration, whatever the, the experience might be. Right, uh, so good, good to know that that's what you were thinking about uh, and, and I, so yes, I agree. Short term, that's the thing to do. 
And I think we all agree that JDIP's thing is kind of a blocker for doing that. Uh, because if we add a match uh, operations, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what would the appropriate behavior for audit be if there is a match.operations? Um, I, uh, I guess you can... You, you could ignore it like today, right? Again, just thinking about, you know, is this a regression or, or, or basically the same experience as today, right? If you had a constrained template that has request users in there, in your rego, it wouldn't work anyway for audit, right? This, this is what we, what we documented as well, right? If you if you have a constraint template that has that in the code, yeah, yes, right. Uh, well, kind of. Uh, it's up to the constraint template author what they want to do there, right? So, as a constraint template author, I need to then be aware that audit is an edge case and handle audit appropriately, mm -hmm. and then as a consumer of the constraint. Uh, of of a constraint, right? That that relies on that constraint template. Mm -hmm. I need to be aware both that audit is an edge case, how and how the constraint template author has decided to handle that edge case, and then how I'm going to handle that edge case. And that may be different for if you have multiple constraint templates that are doing this, right? They, that may be they may need to take a different approach for different constraints, right? So, so that's where the complexity comes in for the furthest downstream user, right? The, the constraint consumer. Mm -hmm. I guess my only point is um, it's, it's technically the same experience as we, what we have today, which to your point is like uh, the, the constraint author would have to, like they, they wouldn't, they, they probably don't know, right, that this particular constraint template doesn't handle uh, users or whatever. Right, right. And, and But the difference with it being then in the, the match criteria mm -hmm. uh, is like Rego, there's no way for a, a constraint template author to return an error, right? It either like, rejects or ignores. Um, it is an option for us if we have a match constraint to raise an error, right? If, if there is not uh, enough information to evaluate that matcher. And that's maybe the right thing to do, right? Because if I am evaluating in audit, right? And there's this matcher. Uh, if I assume match, if there's not enough context to evaluate the match, then, uh, sorry, I'm just seeing the chat here. Uh, if I assume match, then there's not enough context to evaluate the match. Um, then if I am matching against a delete request, right, I'll be raising alerts like I'm trying to delete all the resources on the cluster. So there's going to be like uh, probably a lot of false positives. Uh, if I return an error, uh, then there's going to be a lot of errors, right? Uh, because basically anything that has that matcher can't evaluate. So yeah, users can ameliorate that with JDIP's thing. And then this, this design doc is more about, okay, what's next, right? Because there's this bad pocket of UX that we've walked our, everyone into. How do we get out of it? And so with regard to like the complexity of implementation, for me, 
I I don't I don't want to like think about it like hey we do this immediately. More what I'm concerned about is being thoughtful around. We know we're getting a uh, we're we're digging deeper into this bad UX right now by adding these matchers. So do we have a plan for digging ourselves out of it? And the urgency of that plan, you know, that just depends on how bad the um, experience turns out to be for users and whether there's other value we see in these primitives that we want and we could prioritize based off of that. So, so- Can, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, so I, I just want to clarify something. So one is for for the VAP experience. Um, you know, I don't think the, the like the the operation stuff or the old object stuff. Like, I don't necessarily think that's a gatekeeper bad experience. I I think like for example, like the go old object thing, right? That's that's. The, that you know the so-called bad experience is also there for VAP. It's like native VAP, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so what this is? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. If you have one. Yeah, I guess what I guess what I'm trying to highlight is like this this bad experience that we're talking about. One, I don't think it's like just in Gatekeeper and for, for VAP, right? And two, in terms of like not being able to process certain admission time uh, review input that has existed since the beginning for audit and Gator for that matter, right? So I am curious, like, why now? Why now? Um, well, one, I think it goes toward the value proposition, right? Like that, as you pointed out, will have all this syntax and it will have rough edges. And I think one of the value propositions of Gatekeeper is, or at least the constraint framework, is that it may provide help in smoothing out some of these rough edges, right? Like if we have a, a clearly defined interface for this is the data that's available to you in this context, Right, and this is where this context can be applied. Then constraint template authors, right? The the value of constraint framework increases because there is a stricter contract between the framework and and the code, right? So so you're right. This complexity exists. My point is it shouldn't. Uh, and with regard to constraint consumers. Right. Uh, same, same, same concern. Right. They, they right now, there's no implicit signal in how code is packaged, saying where it can be applied, and this would add that. Um, and so, when you start talking about how this compares with that, right? Uh, this is where I think we do want to do a better job, right? Because mm -hmm. VAP exists inside Kubernetes. It's very like situationally privileged in that respect, right? Like there's, it's, it's already there. Users can use it, right? Um, what VAP is missing is it cannot be used for audit, right? And part of the reason why it can't be used for audit is because it is so hyper-focused on the admission web case that things like requesting verb or resource, requesting user um, are just inextricably tied to its syntax, right? So it doesn't export well to audit. And we can do a better job with that. Right, and we could do a better job with shift left and solving the resource expansion problem of like deployments create pods. I would like to write my rules against pods, but I still would like deployments that would create bad pods to be rejected. Right. Um, so yeah, I. That's where I think we can raise the bar and where we can be pretty clear about how we're raising the bar, right? Like you can imagine, oh, good. 
Uh, no, no, I just, I mean, thanks for answering. I, I was kind of curious, but I, I, I think the, the pain point is there. I understand that. I mean, I, of everyone, I definitely understand the need of it. Um, I'm just trying to figure out a, like, a middle ground where we can support the operations and the requesting users without having to go through this whole migration. Okay, so I'm I'm a little bit confused there because uh, in my mind I'm thinking about two terms like short term and long term, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, short term, it sounds like that middle ground that you're looking for, right? Where we just add this, and then there's there's this edge case, and we live with it for as long as it makes sense to live with it. But then my question would be, do we want to like stay there for forever more, right? Or do we want to have a roadmap? that uh, can uh, can make things a little bit more well thought out in the future. Uh, uh, what which is the short term? Can, can you explain that? I, I didn't get that. Yeah, short, short term. term. Oh, good. Short term is this. Uh, I put it in the chat. Just adding operation and requesting users to the existing handler. That's right. Yeah, we, we wait for JDIP to finish his work, then we do the adding, and that's it. Which uh, will solve the the VAP stuff, uh, the, the gaps there, um, mm -hmm. and could potentially help with audit as well. And then it's a, it doesn't invalidate any existing constraints, right? The, it, will, it will still work as is. Right, what it, what it, in the, the thing that would be new, with the short-term work is that users would now need to be very aware of which match conditions they are using. Uh, because if they want to use a match condition that only makes sense for the webhook, they would need to use JDIP's thing to make sure those constraints only get evaluated by yeah, the Yeah, I think that, that makes sense, right? I think yeah. that, that works, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it works. Uh, so, what I wanted to do, though, was one, acknowledge that this edge case was there and hopefully acknowledge that we probably we we can and should do a better job navigating these edge cases, particularly now that it, admission is is going to be less of an emphasis, I think, because uh, VAP uh, and so audit and referential and, and Gator CLI really become the differentiators. I would also argue multi-platform becomes a differentiator, right? Like you could imagine enforcing policies against GCP or against Azure, what have you. Uh, like you, you bring me your Terraform plan and I will let you know if you're creating a bucket in the wrong country or whatever, you know? Um, and in order to start addressing those use cases, uh, we need to be able to scope policies against multiple different regimes, right? Like you could imagine, say you're running a, a, a cluster on Azure, right? Uh, it, it could be you have a policy that you want to scope for only certain Kubernetes namespaces, and only in certain, and sorry, I'm forgetting how Azure organizes its like cloud hierarchy stuff, but let's say only certain business units or, or projects, right? Like do not enforce this policy in the dev project, but enforce it in production. Uh, I, I might be losing the room, uh, apologies. Uh, do you mind if I knock off really quick and, and come back? Sure. Okay, sorry. Oh, I was talking to myself. 
Um, in the meantime, do we want to talk about any of the other items? Um, Rita, your topic, the exclude sidecar images. You're mute, uh, also. Oh my gosh, so annoying. Sorry about that. Uh, this room I have booked now, so I won't be able to, I won't get kicked out. Yay. Uh, yeah, so with regard to timeline, I don't want to like block more urgent work VAP. I don't want to like assert, hey, let's drop everything and do this. Mm -hmm. uh, this is more seeing the shifting landscape. You know, some of this has frankly always been in my mind. Like I could cite earlier discussions around gatekeeper design where I tried to namespace the match criteria so that we could support this in the future. Mm -hmm. And for simplicity's sake, we decided not to. Um, and so in order to support the multi-environment stuff, uh, you would need to support namespace match criteria which would be a somewhat breaking change to the schema. Uh, so that we would need to handle. That's where a lot of this complexity comes from in the doc. And then the fact that we can also rationalize the target handler, the fact that we're less specific than probably we should have been, that, that's just like a nice first use case for it. Yeah, I, I for the record, I I think the proposal makes sense. I, I just want to see a little bit more thought put put in uh, for the migration experience. Like I, for example, like obviously they need to coexist for a while. Like how long are we talking about, right? And do do we have something that can just like automatically migrate them? I, I don't know, but these are like sort of my thought process because I want to make sure we're not, we don't end up having to like support both of both of the legacy stuff and the new stuff for, for a very long time. Mm. So, um, okay. And, and I think the short-term uh, stuff is, is, I think is good enough in my mind for now. Um, so, so we can always come back to it, uh, come back to this proposal. Yeah. I mean, so if, if we're okay with the notion of expanding the matchers and the, the constraint or sorry, the, the target handler stuff, that's probably the most important thing for me because, uh, we wouldn't be able to have multiple target handlers and a constraint template without updating the match syntax. Um, the, uh, I, the salient difference between like an old school, uh, constraint template and what this would be proposing, the differences would be an old school template could only have one target handler and an old school template would only generate a V1 beta one constraints that would have this singular match syntax, whereas a new school template would allow multiple target handlers and would support multiple match syntax. Uh, so old wise, there shouldn't be a lot of complexity uh, supporting the old stuff ongoing, right? Like it's it's actually just a, a simpler case of, of the newer stuff, right? You can, Imagine just injecting uh, the target handler associated with the match criteria and making sure that they only put one target handler in those constraint templates, and you're kind of done. Uh, with regard to users, constraint template authors can ignore it until they want to leverage it. Um, and then constraint consumers, they would not need to update their constraints unless they wanted to uh, 
integrated breaking change that a constraint template they're using has has done, in which case we'd use that V2 syntax. Um, and as far as like user guidance for constraint users, because these would be different resource versions that would have different schemas, uh, they, it would be built, what is supported would be built into the open API schema for the, the constraints. Uh, and also we can avoid the like KRM backwards compatibility concerns because we are not, because each constraint is a separate kind, right? And a constraint template that leverages the new thing would be making a breaking change. Right, so we would be appending a V2, which would make a new constraint kind. There's no concern about like version conversion or field backwards compatibility. Yeah. I, I mean, can, can we come back to this after the VAP stuff is done? Or do, or do you think this is a blocker for VAP? I I would like to know that we see the problem of of uh, match constraints that or sorry match conditions that don't uniformly apply across the stack and and that we know this is a likely way of solving it if there's other better solutions fine uh I, I just don't want to continue digging deeper into this hole because it will get harder to get out of the the more we bet on this sort of single target structure. I guess I don't want like V2 to be a blocker for using VAP either. No. Oh, no, no, no. And it wouldn't like the... the uh, this is not a development blocker. This is just a directional blocker, right? Because API stuff, right? There's backwards compatibility concerns. For me, I always like to think like, what will we want to do, you know, next year or in the next two years to make sure we're not undermining those efforts by making API choices that we can't undo, right? And adding matchers that are not universally applicable is an example of an API choice that we can't undo. So for me, it's less about this needs to be implemented and more about us kind of agreeing in, in general on the big picture mm -hmm. so, so that we know we're not shooting ourselves in the foot. Right. Does that does that clarify? I I think I'm being a little bit more strict than you're hoping, but also maybe less strict than maybe I was coming off at, at the start here. I think we agree in theory, like in 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 principle. I I think we agree. I think it's just probably just timeline. We might not this might not agree. I don't know. Oh, this doesn't yeah. have a timeline for me. At all, okay. it sounds like the migration will need to be smooth, right? I think that right. that's where it, with, right. the experience would need to be thought out. Right. Yeah, like if this sits for a month or a year, I'm fine, right? Okay. Like, it's this is more just making sure that we are notionally aligned, so that we can unblock the thing that we want to do immediately, which is add those matchers, right? Right. That's all. Like, yeah, we. Uh, if if it doesn't make sense to invest in building it, that's fine. Right, like like the ideal. I don't even know if this is possible, but like the ideal experience would be like, you know, users with v one beta one deploy their stuff, and Gatekeeper would just automatically convert it to v two. Just just as an example, I don't even know if that's possible, but that would and be. A we great we talked some of that with like Jay's proposal initially, like say auto like migration, so like the singular to plural sort of thing. Uh, so maybe we could do something like that. Yeah, yeah. and you could. Have, oh, good. I said maybe. Yeah. 
yeah. or or batch processing in like a shift left kind of way like hey mm -hmm. y'all did this thing can you do can i run a pipeline to migrate it just this once like that that should be very easy to do right right because I, I anyway i think i i you get the my concerns and and that's basically the blocker in my mind but the goals and why we want to do it and how we want to do it i think we we're pretty much aligned on that it's just okay that the actual experience is not as clear to me that's all gotcha okay i think that's that's good enough for me uh for now i i would like to like noodle on the experience over time but okay. i don't think it's a blocker for vmp yeah. if we yeah. know this is kind of how we would solve things generally Right, right. And just to clarify, I definitely sound like this is definitely not blocking that going to, you know, alpha or beta or, or even GA, I guess, right? Like, so I, I think as long as that's not blocked by this, I, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, that's a core concern here, because I agree, it's non-trivial work. Yeah, and, and, and I want to get that to users as soon as possible. <laughs> Okay, so and we can keep iterate on asynchly on the doc because I, I think there are some maybe like questions that we probably need to sort out. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I let's just I do it asynchly. Cool. Thank you. Sorry for the uh, long doc talk. Every time, yeah. <laughs> All right, Sir Tesh. We have eight minutes. Uh, I'm okay to skip and then so it'd be address yours and Prachi's. Uh, okay, um, mine is sort of just like an FYI kind of thing. Um, uh, 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 so so ba so so specifically around like the the service mesh use case. Uh, I I I know a few of us have been paying a few times around. Um, how does Gatekeeper handle? Uh, you know, sidecars and and specifically from service mesh. So I think it might be a good idea to just um, uh, like add a doc for it. And and you know, and and I know uh, like Hiverno specifically has a blog post about that. So I think it might be a good idea for us to do something like that. I I don't think I'm gonna get any like disagreements. I just kind of want to make sure we we know that's. That's something we that that's a gap today. Yeah. Right. Not a functional that, gap, but a doc gap. Sorry, yeah, just a doc gap. Yeah. I, I was gonna say, should we assign this to Xander since he's not here? <laughs> uh, I, anyone can work on it. Okay, anyone. I will uh, tag him. I I actually want this to, um. Yeah, we can we we can assign it to him, but I I, I definitely want to prioritize this and get it out sooner rather than later. All right, uh, all right, I'm done. Um, cool. Yeah, I had the next item on the agenda. Um, this is kind of uh, I wanted to raise it because it's a slightly non-trivial skill, and there's like maybe a a, a non-trivial pull request that has kind of like a bunch of context um, around maybe the motivation and there might be questions. Um, so I think maybe, uh, I, I think uh, Sertak and Rita, I, I hope I pronounced the name correctly, um, you guys are already tagged on the pull request, um, but I just wanted to kind of uh, give an overview and also uh, have the opportunity to answer any questions, um, uh, this kind of a thing. So uh, I'll back up. This is a change that I'd like to make for um, the gatekeeper audit manager, um, specifically how it populates violations into constraint status. So in the current moment, um, we audit the cluster and uh, uh, derive some violations, uh, and there's no guarantees on 
which violations get populated into constraint status. Um, we just populate basically up until the constraint violations limit that's kind of preset. And uh, there are other better uh, guaranteed ways of emitting violations, for example, uh, to, log to audit logs, um, basically other ways. Um, but I think uh, it might just be useful uh, just for the purposes of like seeing diffs in cluster state um, if we just sorted some of these violations. Uh, again, up until the constraint violations limit. Um, so I gave an example in the issue I filed. So for example, um, if you are looking at the status of a constraint before and after a cluster restart, for example, um, as of right now, there's kind of no way to compare based on just the violations in the cluster status, um, you know, how, the the whether there was a change in the total number of violations or the kind of uh, resources violating that constraint um, and and I I think I just want to add some sorting logic into this just to make the comparisons a bit easier um, and then I uh, use the Golang heap library just to um, you know keep the performance runtime of the code basically the same as before. Yeah, it sounds it. like your motivation, Prachi, is the diff is being different every single time? Every single time. Um, yeah. I mean, of course, like we can check the audit logs, we can check the number of total violations is also reported on the constraint status. Um, but just like, a, I think the small change might uh, definitely won't hurt. I haven't looked at the PR, but uh, TLDR, like, is this sorting the entire thing and then only return the the first, the top batch, or how are you? In effect, yes, but there's a heap. So mm -hmm. it's like, um, it, it, it winds up being effectively a constant time thing. Uh, you're, you're only keeping the top... 20 or whatever the reporting limit is, uh, constraint mm -hmm. or violations. And it's constantly like adding and removing them. And then ah, when so it you're comes to sorting time, as you're inserting. Got yeah. It. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, I mean, sounds like a good improvement. Uh, and, and so, and, and performance wise, are you seeing dramatic changes? Does it take much um, yeah. yeah, because the size of whatever you're holding is at most up to the constraint violations to limit, um, yeah, that there shouldn't be any performance impact. And there would, would it be make sense to test it on like a larger number of uh, violations or do you, do you, you don't think there's going to be any performance difference? I mean, like, even if you test it on up to like 500, but if if you're inserting on a constant time list, then kind of the sorting is probably only taking constant time. I'm I'm happy to like test it as well, but um, yeah, I I don't think there's a vast difference. I think there's there's two things here one like yeah maybe three testing is good uh this is the least computationally complex way to do it i can think of it will be like an extra step per violation but i imagine like evaluating rego is much more expensive than the n log n where n is 20 or 200 even uh insert uh but if we are concerned about risk we can add a flag to disable this, right? So if users hit performance limits and uh, they're not interested in the sorting, they could just bypass it. Would, is, is that sufficient? Yeah, and also a small thing, like uh, when you're sorting on insert, because it's kind of held like a tree, it's just O of log n, so like, O of log 20 or O of log 200. 
you're right. Yeah, sorry. Uh, log, log fine tune. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so maybe for next steps, let's do the testing with like a larger number of violations, like 10,000 or something like that. Um, and then see if there is any time difference. If, if not, then we can just enable by default maybe, or, or if, if there's a difference, then we can add a flag. Okay, yeah, I can test this. I don't think we need 10,000 anyway because of the SCD yeah I thought it would might be up to 500 yeah maybe maybe something more reasonable yeah like, I think the top suite said like 3,000 yeah maybe something like 3, that yeah. Can, can yeah something SCD like, SCD I don't know, like two, two, three thousand. I think we tested before yeah oh okay you tested with 3,000 before yeah like way way before oh, yeah okay. it depends on the like number of characters and stuff too right, because right, of right. the message um I think it's better on that yeah gotcha Oi. Thank you for looking at this. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, I like this a lot. Yeah, I think that that's going to help a lot of people. Yeah, thank you. Does that give you what you were looking for? Yeah, I think I can. Yeah, I can spin this up and, and yeah, ideally get some traction by the end of the week or something. Wait, well, that is time. Uh, thank you, everybody, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. Bye.